worship. What joy we feel when we are called together to celebrate God's love. God's, God's love, love flows, flows through our, our lives. lives. This is what it means to be the body of Christ. This, this is what it means to be faithful, faithful witnesses to God. God. Let us rejoice on this day. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you pour on us. Amen. Amen. As summer draws to a close, we begin to focus our attention on the activities of autumn. For some, it will mean preparing children for school. For others, youth will be preparing to enter college or the workforce or perhaps the military service. For St. John's Church, it will be a time of change and transitioning. Be with each other as we life's challenges. Open our hearts to receive your guidance and your transforming love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I were to retitle this, and of course I picked this title out a month or so ago um, when I was designing the text for today, instead of calling it necessarily the promised land, 
I almost would like to recall it, the dreams of Joseph. Hmm. The dreams of Joseph. And I'm going to read to you this morning Genesis 47, reading verses 18 through 24. When that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, We cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We are land as well. Buy us and our land in exchange just for food. And we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. And I love this phrase. Give us seed so that we may live and not die. And that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from the allotment Pharaoh had given them. That is why they did not sell their land. And Joseph said to the people, now that I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you so you can plant the ground. But when the crops come in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh and the other fourth-fifths you may keep as seed for your fields and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. Hmm. We often don't read this section of scripture. <laughs> we like to read the chapters before because that's what we grew up with. That's the stories that we were told. Do you remember the story about Joseph? when he was a young boy, the youngest of his father's sons, and his brothers didn't like him very much. <laughs> he was the one that got the coat of many colors and looked right out there and in their faces all the time as their father's favorite son. And then as he got a little older, he began to interpret dreams and kind of stand out. They didn't like that. And do you remember what happened to Joseph? They took him and they put him in a pit. <laughs> and they sold him to the Ishmaelites, people on their way to Egypt. My God. Goodness, they did not love their brother <laughs> very much. And you know, when he got to Egypt, he was sold again to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Wow. When you think of that in itself, to have been taken from his family, and he, now his father thinks he is dead, and now he comes into the household of Potiphar as a slave. Wow. And as he's in prison, he is there, and Joseph becomes friends with some of the men in prison, and two of them have a dream. Hmm. And as he interprets those dreams, he states to them that one of them will regain their position that they lost, and the other one will die. Wow. I don't know if I would have wanted to hear that dream, wondering which one was me. Hmm. And while he was there, Pharaoh hears about his ability 
to interpret dreams. And he too has a dream and can't figure out, and no sorcerer, no one he talks to seems to make sense of this dream. And it doesn't come true. So he petitions Joseph and says, you interpret this dream. And he does. Joseph then says, well, Pharaoh, I'm going to tell you that for seven years you're going to have plenty in the land of Egypt. It's going to seem like the food never ends. We're going to do above and beyond. But then after that, the seven years following, there's going to be famine in Egypt and all the other countries around. Hmm. Pharaoh recognizes that somehow Joseph has a God-given ability to understand the future and to understand dreams that are given by God. So guess what he does? He takes him out of prison and he makes him his chief administrator for Egypt. What a promotion. Wow. So Joseph, realizing what he has interpreted and what lies ahead, he begins to realize that now he is control over the economy of Egypt and the decisions that are made. Even during these years now, seven years of plenty, he begins to store away seed and grain in barns, puts it away. Everybody's thinking, he's a little crazy. Why is he doing this? We should be enjoying this and just whatever, eating to our heart's content and our stomachs. But Joseph understood the dream, and he realized that this was not going to last forever. So he kept putting away. And before you know it, seven years go by, and then all of a sudden, famine hits Egypt and the countries surrounding. Now, there is no bread. Hmm. There is no bread. In the meantime, his father, Jacob, and sometimes called Israel, Realize that famine has even come to Canaan. So he sends his children, his sons, to Joseph, who he doesn't know who he is. Sends go and beg for food, whatever it takes. And when they come before Joseph, he looks at them and realizes, you're my brothers. Hmm. You're my brothers. He said, I will help you, but first you go and you get your father Jacob to come and bring his newest son, Benjamin, with him. I want to see him. So they do. They go back and realize that unless they bring their dad, their father, and their youngest brother, they are not going to get any food or grain. When they come back, Joseph performs a test on them, hides something in the youngest son's backpack to see if they would pass a test of honesty and true love, to see if his brothers had changed in any way over the years. And he finds out they have. They're willing to give their lives instead of their youngest brother because I don't think they believed their dad could lose another son like they had Joseph. And at that point, Joseph says, Do you know who I am? Hmm. Do you know who I am? I'm your brother, Joseph. I don't know about you, but that would have made me step back a few feet and gulp and wonder, is he even going to take care of us? And is he going to forgive us? And Joseph does. 
In fact, with Pharaoh's permission, he tells his father, you can come and live in this land, and I will give you the best land that there is, and I will provide for you through Pharaoh. Come and bring our family here. And he does. And at the same time, this famine is growing larger and larger in Egypt. And all of the people are beginning to come to Joseph to say, we are hungry. We need grain. We need food. How are we going to survive? And Joseph, being a remarkable businessman, he begins to buy what they have. He buys their cattle first, takes all that in, and it's kind of a relief to them in some ways because they don't even have fodder in which to feed their cows at that time. They were hungry themselves. So they gladly gave their livestock and their sheep and whatever they had to Joseph. And now it belongs to Pharaoh. <laughs> they realize that there was no more bread, no more grain to be had. Joseph begins to put away all that he buys, all that he gains in storage, and he takes care of. What wisdom. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of wisdom when I was buying and selling my houses that I have had over the years. Or even foreseeing into the future what the future might hold, whether it's going to be bountiful or whether there is going to be a famine. Well, the Egyptians come back. And they say to Joseph, Joseph, we have given you everything that we have, our livestock, whatever, and now we only have our bodies and our land left. We can give you that if you'll at least give us grain. And Joseph says, okay. So he makes them servants and farmers of the land that he now owns, <laughs> that belongs to Potiphar. But at the same time that they are giving to him, he is putting that aside as a salvation for the people. And they don't know it. You know, this kind of reminds me of times in our lives where we feel that we have lost everything. And I'm sure the Egyptian people felt that way. And who is going to come along and rescue them in this time of famine? Where is their hope? Should we be discouraged? Should we give up? Should we curse God? What should we do? Kind of reminds me of an illustration of Charlie Brown, you know, the Peanuts cartoon. I love that. And in this particular cartoon, Lucy is philosophizing, as she always did. And Charlie's sitting there just listening to her rant and rave. And as usual, Lucy has the floor, and she's delivering one of her long lectures to Charlie. And she says, Charlie Brown, life is a lot like a deck chair. Some people place the chair so they can see where they're going. Other people place the chair so they can see where they have been. And other people place the chair facing this way so they can see what's going on in the present. Charlie gets all ruffled and he says, well, that's great for all of them, but I can't even get my chair unfolded. <laughs> Won't I face it in some kind of direction? 
I love that because it so simply tells us sometimes how life looks to us. We can look in the back and what has been. We can see the pluses and the minuses. We can look forward and hopefully through God, we can see hope and a future. And sometimes we're only stuck sitting where we are and we can't look either way. We're too afraid. We just want to be in the present. Hmm. Can you identify with Charlie? <laughs> Life gets rough at times. And some of the choices we have to make can be very difficult. We find ourselves in that old saying, and I love this saying, I'm always between a rock and a hard place. I never understood that as a child until I got my leg caught in between a rock and I couldn't pull it out. Then I understood it. We get kind of stuck with two possibilities or three possibilities and we don't know which way to go. And when you get in that kind of situation, that's what I call a dilemma. <laughs> Have you ever used that word? I'm in a dilemma. And there are all kinds of dilemmas in life. There are multitasking dilemmas. Have you ever been in one of those? Where you're doing three or four different things at the same time, and you're in a dilemma and you don't know which one to choose to put your attention on? So they all don't get your attention? And you do it not the best? And then there can be emotional dilemmas in life. You love somebody. You have loved them for years. But now they have a gambling problem or something going on in their lives that's robbing them of who they are and also causing financial difficulty in your life. You love them, but what do you do? And then there sometimes can be geographical dilemmas where you own two homes in two different places and now medical bills have risen and you don't know which one to sell. Geographical dilemmas. And then sometimes there are even spiritual dilemmas in our, in our lives. Oh, yeah, Jesus tells us to love our neighbors more than we love ourselves. But my neighbor over there is a Democrat. Oh, no, he's a Republican. How can I love him? You understood that, didn't you? Yes, you did. He's different. She's different. They don't move to the same beat of the drummer I have. But I'm supposed to love them. That's a spiritual dilemma. Hmm. You know, at St. John's, I think we have also arrived at a time in our history where we are going to have to make some critical decisions based on our growth, in our church, based on the attendees and those who come and participate, based on our financial resources, our expenses, our opportunities for ministry, our youth involvement, our sustainability, our projected deaths in the coming year our usable income, our building's fun functionality, hmm. and our ability to serve in the community. These are not going to be easy decisions for us to make. And I don't think any decision that we choose to do will be perfect. I just don't think it will. Will it be possible? Yes. Will it be what God wants us and needs us to do? Yes. 
but it won't be perfect. You know, I know right now the Resolution Committee is working so hard to determine what options we have as a church. And I believe they will come with the best suggestion. And there are many possibilities to consider. And I think they are looking at all of them and trying to find the one or the few that are feasible choices. And they will be based on our finances and our energy to operate as a church. What are we able to give? You know, maybe it's time that we look at our situation through the eyes of Joseph. <laughs> I like that. That's why these stories are here, are for our inspiration and our guidance and our leadership. And I am sure when Joseph's brothers threw him in that pit and then sold him as a slave, he thought to himself, my life is over. I'm never going to go back and see my dad and my mom. I'm sure when he lost all ties to his beloved father, he thought, I'm never going to see my papa again. So many times in his young life, he probably thought that even God had abandoned him. And then his family had deserted him. Can you imagine how hopeless he must have felt? I can't imagine being in a pit. But you know, God had another plan for him. <laughs> That's what I love about this. Even when he went into Egypt and he became the controller of Pharaoh's estate and enterprise, God had a plan for him. He would be the one that would save all of these people in so many different countries from starvation. He would be the one that would lead them and save them. They couldn't have done it on their own. And God used Joseph's new circumstances and changed, and all the changes that were happening in his life for the good. Oh, if we can only believe that for ourselves. Sometimes decisions and choices and changes come out of the need of the circumstance. But you know, God is always there to make the best out of what we have. You know, this reminds me this morning, you've been listening to the news and all the fires that have happened in Hawaii. And I think of that. Everything they have known for many families is just totally destroyed. They have nothing to go back to. What if that happened to us? What if everything we had was taken away or had to be changed or like for the people of Egypt had to be given over to Pharaoh just to be able to eat? What would we do? God would be there. <laughs> God is going to be there for the people in Hawaii. He is going to be there to help them through many others. Hmm. He is going to take those ashes and out of those ashes is going to rise up new and better challenges and things for the people. As difficult as that may seem, it is possible. You know, I love the saying that the people of Egypt said to Joseph. And maybe this is our prayer that we need to say today at St. John's. 
Give us, O oh God, seed, seed, things that we can plant so that we can live and not die. And that the land may not become desolate. Hmm. Give us seed so that we may live and not die and that the land may not become desolate. And if we do, if we believe that God will give us seed for us giving ourselves and what we have to him, he will use it for his glory. And for St. John's for years to come. Amen. God, we come to you today knowing you are there as our father. You are there as our brother, our king and our redeemer, our healer and also our comforter. 
We come to you for many reasons and some personal and hidden reasons that we cannot share with others. But we bring our concerns to you knowing that you understand them and you hear them even without them being said. We pray for the Dinger family today that have lost a loved one through his time of illness and pain he now has comfort and peace. We ask that you would be with his family and provide for them. Give them the peace that they need in their grief. We also pray for those on our prayer list, for our shut-ins in our community and our church. We pray for those that are in need this day of housing those in need of shelter and food, for the people of Hawaii and also the people in Canada, the people in Washington State that have lost their homes and everything that they own. Lord, may you send them possibilities. May you send them resources. And may you hold their hearts in your hand and give them comfort in times of distress. Lord, we ask that you would be with St. John and the committees that continue to meet and our council as they need to make decisions for our future. Be with our community, with our state and our nation as we are moving in so many different directions. Lead us according to your will and purpose for our lives. And we also pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And may you go with his love 
and his hands extended into the world. Peace be with you. Amen. Thank you.